This episode of the Construction Record is brought to you by the Ontario Sewer and Water Main Construction Association. Clean water is everybody's business. Episode 71 of the Construction Record Podcast. I'm digital media editor Warren Fry. I'm staff writer Russell Hickson. Uh, and I've been off in Toronto and busy, but uh, holding down the fort has been Russell. So Russell, tell us what you got. Well, uh, this is news that's already broke, but there will be a new executive director of the BC Building Trades. I know you interviewed him. His name is Andrew Mercier. I believe that's how you pronounce it. Yeah, Mercier or Mercier. Say Mercier is a safe bet. Yeah, he's a labor lawyer. So we we already have a story up where we chatted with him, but we also chatted with uh, with Tom Sigurdsson as well, and just kind of having him reflect on his life advocating for labor and being involved in the building trades uh, for many many years. And it was kind of interesting just to hear how he got involved in mm-hmm. the building trades. Sort of sideways through Alberta. Yeah, he had a whole political career in Alberta where he ran and won um, a seat. And it was after he worked with uh, Grant Notley, uh, who was the province's lone NDP MLA. Yep, uh, I can tell you as somebody from Alberta, it is not easy to win ML- an NDP seat. Yeah. Or at least it wasn't back in the day. <laughs> and it's interesting that his daughter, Rachel Notley, went on to right, yeah. be premier of Alberta. Mm-hmm. Um, and so Tom kind of uh, was involved in Alberta politics for a while. And he came to represent a district that had a lot of uh, tradespeople in it. Mm-hmm. And he became the labor critic. And that kind of was part of his entry into that arena. Mm-hmm. And then he came back to BC and was doing some freelancing. And eventually he got became executive director of the building trades for a while. He went to uh, Ottawa to do some work for Canada's building trades unions, Mm -hmm. uh, and then he also did some uh, training plan coordinating for a Teamsters union in Vancouver, and then he came back once again as executive director of Mm -hmm. the building trades, uh, which he is now. Which I've known him for as long as I've been working here. Yeah, he's been doing it a long time. He's been a very, very outspoken uh, advocate for the labor movement. Um, And he just talked to me about how He's so passionate about uh, Indigenous inclusion and women on the tools uh, and apprenticeships. And those are three things that uh, he just kind of came back to and over, came back to over and over Mm -hmm. um, as just things that he's passionate about um, and things that he wants to continue to advocate for after he leaves the building trades um, on various uh, committees, subcommittees and working groups. He's hoping to continue some of those issues. Uh, as well, so it was it was cool to to chat with him just about some of those things, and see what else. Oh, I also wrote a story that's going to be coming out uh, about an Oxford Properties Group project mm-hmm. uh, in South Burnaby. Uh, it's really really interesting. So they have an existing kind of industrial development there that's multiple buildings, um, and. They decided to do something that is done in other parts of the world. Uh, it's like a multi-level industrial development. Mm-hmm. So you have kind of loading bays and industrial space, and then you go up this huge ramp where like made huge trucks and, and different vehicles like that can get up there. And there's you know more ramps and more bays and, mm-hmm. and, and more kind of loading space and industrial space up there. And this is done in like really really tight industrial markets, places like Asia. Yeah. Um, or like bigger American cities, that kind of thing? Very few. Yeah. Like maybe Seattle, New York, San mm-hmm. Francisco, places like that where land is really, well, it's really expensive. Dense, yeah. it's well, it's really denser too, though. And it's expensive. denser too. Yeah, it, well, we're kind of fenced in by the water in the mm-hmm. mountains. And so they're finding that industrial space is getting so tight in Vancouver that they're using this kind of multi-level industrial space technique mm-hmm. um, to try and solve that problem and get the most out of industrial land, which is just becoming more and more scarce. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's part of the River Bend Business Park in South Burnaby, uh, and it's going to be a first for all of Canada. It's about seven hundred and seven thousand square feet uh, of space over two levels. Um, it's kind of cool. They did it on a sixty-four acre brownfield area, which is the whole development that used to be like a paper mill. Um, and another issue is they did like this whole amenities project with it as well on the riverfront with trails and all sorts of things. Mm-hmm. 
because another issue in Vancouver is is labor. In order to get labor, you have to attract it. Right. And if you want to attract labor, you have to have a nice place to work. Yeah. And so that's become a big part of uh, these some of these industrial pro- projects, and which is illustrated in this is, you know, if you want people to work there, it's got to be nice. Mm-hmm. And so they have all these trails and all these different things, and so that was another focus of it as well. So that's kind of cool. And then finally, I have one more story that I covered, and this is <laughs> this has been going on for a while. Uh, the poor city of Saskatoon. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, they they got duped by someone pretending to be a construction company official, mm-hmm. uh, and they changed the payment uh, direction uh, for some project, and about a million dollars went wish. into a wrong account, a fraudulent account. Uh, but it looks like through the courts and through investigation, they've managed to get all of that, all that money back. That's surprising. Yeah. Do you think that'd be laundered or spent or whatever once it got in the wrong account? They found the accounts and I believe they were able to kind of shut them down, freeze mm-hmm. them. Uh, and then it, I think it took a while for the courts to you know work through the red tape to get those funds released. Um, but it looks like they have done that. Um, and so now they're doing uh, internal audits to kind of change how they operate, like how they how they do their payments, mm-hmm. um, and to make sure that this fraud doesn't happen again. But I don't know. I don't know how common this is. That didn't it happen a, a couple of years ago with uh, somewhere in Edmonton. I can't remember I've, the exact I've never case, heard of this. But I've never heard of this happening. But I mean, it's just a little reminder, I guess, to be careful and, and have yeah. good security measures in place to know you know where's money where money is moving around, and you know someone just calls you or sends you an email. They might not be who they say they are. I might be thinking of a non-construction related example of this happening, because I'm sure that happens as well. Right. Well, I mean, these are what you would call kind of social engineering exactly, yeah. uh, tactics mm-hmm. rather than kind of brute force hacking and, exactly. and finding vulnerabilities, just using human... Which is actually the biggest way hacking happens. Yeah. <laughs> like, it, it, everybody thinks it's some guy at a keyboard, and part of it is, but part of it is fooling people. Most of it is just... Preying on human beings, yeah, fraudulent to, to access evil. to access things like that. So yeah, that's kind of what I have been working on the past week. Okay, what about and you? Uh, yeah, I've been in Toronto for the past week. Uh, most of which I was at the uh, Canadian Council for Public Private Partnerships uh, conference, which we do every year. Oh, yes, P threes. Yes, P threes. Um, but the interesting thing, and I said this in our P three special to Vince uh, Versace, National Managing Editor, was that. Uh, in previous years, it's been there's been a big focus on technology, and you know there's a lot of hand waving that goes with that. Not that that's anybody's fault, but that's just what happens with technology stories. They're just they just lend themselves to that, uh, and a lot of this is our amazing project here and our amazing project there, and this, this is what P3 is accomplishing. This year, it was different. It felt like there was more inclusive. It felt way more international. Like there were a lot of people from all over the world, mm. uh, and that always happens. There are always delegations there. I think a couple years ago, I met up with a, a bunch of uh, guys from the Mexican delegation, and they were a great guys and b just really enthused about P3s. But it, this seemed a little more like everybody was there to learn from each other and less we're here. You know, I think it was, maybe I'm misrepresenting, mis- but it seemed to be people were coming to learn about P3s and now it's like everybody sort of has that in hand and is kind of collaborating and figuring out stuff amongst themselves. Right. Uh, and um, Mark Romo, the president, said that. He said that there's a, that people are coming, we're learning from them and they're learning from us. Um, besides that, a lot more focus on the social impact of P3s and of just uh, uh, infrastructure generally. Um, they had uh, Nathan Obed, uh, who was um, the, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to get the name right, but it, uh, head of a big Inuit organization, and he was explaining how infrastructure can get up to the north and how, you know, again, collaboration can happen back and forth between the two sets of people. Um, and the two people I talked to, uh, two people I talked to about two different rail projects. One was Brad Smith from the Valley Line LRT project, which ran into some trouble recently because they had to stop their procurement process. Ah, yes. Yes, because SNC Lavalin withdrew, not because of the actual project itself, from what he told me, but more because they were restructuring and this didn't fit into their new restructuring regimen. Um, and then another company withdrew because um, they weren't comfortable with the procurement of trains. Um, and, and that apparently is a big deal amongst engineers. They don't, that's a big pile of risk involved with the vehicle part. They of these bundled things. the project. Exactly. And that didn't, they bundled and, that, and that's, that's not what they're doing this time because they're doing a whole new line of procurement and they're kind of learning about P3, maybe seeing if they're going to go P3 or not, or probably likely they will, but that's one of the reasons they were down there. They sort of make connections mm-hmm. and, and explain the methodology of this whole thing. Um, a different project, um, 
which is a way bigger scale, the, the, not, the Valley Line is not small. Uh, I talked to Rick Mead, who's a senior executive officer with Los, a- Los Angeles Metro, and um, people don't know about this, the uh, Los Angeles Metro. It's actually, I've been on it. It's actually a great, um, if you need to get a tourist destination, it's a great subway line, and it's dirt cheap too, which is surprising for such a spread out long uh, uh, city as, as Los Angeles, but he was talking about they don't know if they're necessarily going for P3, but they're probably going to for, for some parts of it. And he said um, what they're looking at is probably potentially phasing their project. So you work on one section and another section. It just makes it brings costs down and it makes it easier to do, especially as a P3. Um, and one of the reasons they want to get it done quickly is because the Olympics are coming in 2028. So just like we were with uh, 2010 in the Olympics, they've, they're kind of in the same situation. They have to get these lines done ahead of time. And so they want to get it done as quickly and as efficiently as they can. They're also looking at a model that isn't P3 called project development agreements and that's where they bring private uh, developers in with the government right from the beginning so right during the environmental process so they're working out together how to develop alignments and modes of travel and it's 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 not quite okay we figured this out now we're hiring somebody it's it's there's way more collaboration at the start yeah exactly Um, and he also talked about the airport metro connector which is um, there's a set of tracks that's been going out to the LAX forever and now they're actually going to finally have it so that they the railway system will be integrated into that area of tracks with LAX. So that was a particular interest to me since I go down to LA every year and I go to LAX. Um, so anyway, without further ado, let's listen to, uh, let's start with Brad Smith, Project Director for the Valley Line at LRT. This feature interview is brought to you by the Greater Toronto Sewer and Water Main Contractors Association, building water and sewer infrastructure excellence since 1957. This feature interview is brought to you by the Ontario Sewer and Water Main Construction Association, Ontario's champion for sustainable and safe water and sewer infrastructure. I'm Brad Smith with the City of Edmonton. I'm the project director for the Valley Line LRT. And you just gave a sort of procurement update, I guess, more than anything else. Uh, but to understand that, we should probably go back to what happened in the first place, which was that um, well, the line was proposed, it was P3, and then two of the proponents withdrew. So if you could give a little background as to why that happened, uh, and then how you guys sort of dealt with building it back up from there. Sure. Yeah, so we started off last year, um, or earlier this year, in, in March of 2019, launching a procurement for a design build finance with vehicles included. Uh, we uh, we had three teams submit, we, we, they all pre-qualified, uh, and then after we announced our shortlist, but before we launched the request for proposals, two of those three teams withdrew. And why did they? One of, one of them was uh, SNC-Lavalin, um, they, that was leading the team, uh, and so I think you know it's quite established. They, they pulled out a, a yep. number of procurements at the same time as part of their corporate restructuring and a new focus. Um, on, on the types of projects they want they want to pursue, so that one was maybe less um, related to our specific project uh, or our specific deal. Um, the other team that withdrew, uh, they withdrew over concerns about um, vehicle delivery risk and system integration risk and things that um, generally the, the heavy civil contractors don't want to don't want to manage. They don't want to price it. They don't want to take on that risk. Um, and so, um, after the two teams withdrew, we we, we interviewed 24 uh, different contractors through a market sounding process, and that became kind of the key theme out of that out of that market sounding. That the the vehicle supply and integration risk was really uh, creating a lot of angst in the market. Um, so that brings us to where we are today. Uh, we've reassessed. Um, and we've decided to split the vehicles out and we will procure those separately and allow the design build contractor to really focus on building the infrastructure itself. And so you have a definite, I just saw in your session, you have a definite timeline and it's a pretty short one. So uh, A, could you sort of list off that timeline and B, could you tell me why it's so short? Sure. Um, well, we it, it, it relates back to the market sounding and some of the feedback we heard. Um, you know the industry is is hot. Uh, there's a lot of projects out there that they can pursue. Uh, there's a lot of projects that are already underway. Um, so contractors are are really choosing which projects they want to pursue a lot more carefully, and they're making go no go decisions a lot earlier in the process than maybe they were five years ago. 
Um, so part of this is to say uh, we want to get as much information out to you up front so you can make that go no go decision and then once we get into procurement it's going to be quick and snappy and get to financial close as fast as possible to save everyone the time and effort that goes into these uh, pursuits both on the owner side and, and on the private side so uh, it's really it's not necessarily about meeting a, a date or schedule it's about optimizing level of effort for all parties and ultimately getting the project going uh, sooner rather than later okay and the originally it was originally a p3 and it remains a p3 project so it's not you've lost faith in the p3 process it's yeah it, yeah it's still a p3 um you know it, it depends how you define p3 but it, you know design build finance uh there's still an element of private financing it's 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 short-term financing not long-term um but you still have that private finance at risk um, for performance, it's still a performance-based specification rather than a prescriptive specification. Um, and so, yeah, you're still kind of leveraging the strengths of the private sector, allocating risk where appropriate. So it, it has a lot of the same features of a, a P3. And the, 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 the sort of features of the line itself are unchanged. It's the same as I maybe you could explain. You said it's more integrated with the community. Like I, I grew up in a to begin with, but yeah. then when there was, it was kind of separate from everything else. Yeah. This, this is not that, apparently. This is not that. No, this is a this is a very um, urban style system, um, human scale, uh, blended into the neighborhoods. Um, it's It will look and feel uh, and operate a little bit more like a streetcar than a, a heavy rail or commuter rail system. Um, so yeah, it's, it's low floor boarding, it's um, small, smaller stops um, and not uh, the, the large stations that we have now right. and uh, yeah focused on kind of enhanced landscaping streetscaping and things to really blend in blend in it features like enhanced streetscaping enhanced landscaping um, and improving the urban realm to, to really blend it into the communities does that add a layer of complexity you don't have with the other or is it just a question of examples and oranges one is complex for this reason one is complex for that reason uh, I think I think it's just the way that we're trying to leverage investment in transit in general, and it's not unique to Valley Line. It's something that we're we're doing on all of our LRT extensions, um, and it's really about yeah more creating creating a healthy city, creating vibrant urban places, um, making communities where the LRT is an attractive place to live because ultimately. We want to densify around our LRT lines, around our transit, and uh, and try to uh, try to um, slow down some of the, the sprawl um, and the way that our, our community has traditionally developed. Um, and just one other thing: there's a lot of interface points with that, and there was a challenge with the previous line that the signal's not working, even though the rest of it. And mm -hmm. I assume you guys obviously are going to address that. But yeah. how much of a challenge is that? Because it seems like it integrates with two other lines, I think. Well, yeah, so it'll be a physical, this is an extension of the Valley Line right. Southeast. So that's, you know, it's a direct extension of that line. So there's physical connection, there's connections from systems and future operation and maintenance. Um, and then it's physically separate though from our existing LRT network, our high floor system. So um, yeah, so those interfaces are there. Um, they are manageable. The uh, the key thing is having vehicles and systems that are going to be compatible and interoperable with what's being built now on on Valley Line Southeast or, uh, or Stage One. Is that to do? It's. Uh, I wouldn't say it's difficult. It's about prescribing uh, the right systems, and it's kind of um, taking off-the-shelf type equipment. Um, that any contractor can buy and implement on their line. Um, and then the, anything that's on the vehicle itself will be included with the vehicle procurement. Um, so there will be a, a layer of system integration that the city takes on with this. Um, but I think because of the, the way the system is designed, the fact that it is more of a line of sight operation, we don't have a, a communication-based train control or anything like that. Um, that uh, you know, it's it's less 
the, the degree of complexity is a little less than we might have seen on on previous projects in, in Edmonton. Okay, great. Uh, thanks. Canadian Council of Public-Private Partnerships Annual Conference, and I'm here with... I'm Rick Mead. I'm the Senior Executive Officer with Los Angeles Metro. And he just gave a talk about the various projects that have on the go, some of which are going to be P3 or not, and that's kind of my first question. You came here to find out if that's a good idea, so maybe you could explain uh, which projects you think lend themselves to that and what you hope to learn here. Okay, so <clears throat> the, the there's three projects that we're looking at that are potential for P3 development. Uh, one is the West Santa Ana branch. Mm -hmm. It's a 20 mile light rail project. The other is, a, is called the East San Fernando Valley Transit Quarter. That is a nine mile light rail project, uh, primarily street running. And, um, and then the third project is the Sepulveda Pass project, which is uh, uh, we're, we're looking at a what we're calling a PDA or a project development agreement mm -hmm. for that project. So those are the three. We're, we, we haven't made a final decision on any of them yet mm -hmm. as, as to whether we're going to uh, develop them as P3. Right now we're in a value for money analysis. We're looking at risk, risk transfer, and the cost of that risk transfer. and depending on how that analysis comes out, if it makes good business sense for Metro to proceed with those, mm -hmm. then we will proceed with them as a P3. And you, know, you said that the, the Olympics are a factor in all this too. They are a factor, yes. So we're uh, looking to complete as much of these projects as possible by the 2028 Olympics. And so, um, you know the potential for phasing these projects is uh, is 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 something that we're looking at because um, uh, if if you're building a portion of a line, it it's uh, less costly and it's from a, from a schedule perspective, uh, you can get it done more quickly. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, very interested in completing this project by the 2028 Olympics. What are some of the challenges that I can think of too? Uh, that LA is kind of unique, and I, it's for one thing, it's spread out everywhere, and for another thing, it's a series of cities. So, how much of a complication, or is that a complication? Well, it is a, um, it, you know, it makes the projects complex, but what we uh, make every effort to do is to reach out to each community, develop relationships with each community, and. Um, have communities participate in what we're doing as much as possible and really part of the environmental process that we go through to to environmentally clear these lines uh, ha a big factor in that is developing the relationships with each of the local agencies mm -hmm. and um, reaching out to the community we do a lot of public meetings we um, ask the public to uh, tell us what their concerns are and what the challenges are from their perspective and uh, you know we do everything we can to mediate those challenges or and those those concerns. And could you explain what, the, what a PDA is because I heard it and I'm like I haven't heard that and I've heard plenty of terms before but I haven't heard of that one. <laughs> yeah it's a it's a project development agreement PDA and what it does is it um, brings the a private developer on board with us way up front, a couple of years up front, prior to uh, getting ready for a financial close. And has that developer work with us d through the environmental process to develop alignments, um, to develop modes of travel, and uh, um, help us uh, um, use the innovative capacity of the private industry through that process to, to, to find an alignment that's economically beneficial, that is most efficient in moving people. Um, and uh, um, at the same time, blends in with our environmental process. So, uh, you know, we, we, we developed a, a, a certified environmental document at the same time that the PDA is complete. And then we'll enter into a, once the PDA uh, portion of the contract is over, then we uh, give the PDA 
developer an opportunity to negotiate with us for a P3 contract okay. that takes it on through completion. That's what I was going to ask us because it seems, sounds very similar to a P3, but yeah, it's, it's uh, no, it's not, no. Okay, and are, uh, beyond 2028, uh, what sort of, if you can tell me, what kind of future plans do you have? Because I know, as a counterexample, that there's been that line to the to the LAX, which just now will finally be completed. Actually, actually, that's a good question. How did you manage to pull that off? <laughs> because it's taken so long for that to happen. You're talking about Crenshaw, or were you talking one, about? The, I think there's a, there's airport a, metro actually, connector. Yeah, the airport metro connector. Yes. Um, so the airport metro connector, great project, very interesting project. It's the it's the city of LA's gateway to LA, mm -hmm. and um, we went through a uh, about a three year board board process where our planning department on the on the planning side developed concepts to, for the for the the best way to get the uh, the transit system to mm -hmm. the airport. And um, you know, based on the, the ridership and based on the cost, um, that study determined the best way was to interface with the automated the, the LAX automated people mover. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the way that that developed. Um, we we ended up uh, with a uh, concept to put a station right. Um, that that uh, uh, interfaces with the with the automated people mover. Mm -hmm. We've been developing that station. We've got a design. It's gonna. It's probably gonna go out to bid here uh, by February. And I assume that's another one that is affected by Olympics because that would be one one of the main reasons to have it is people flying in and you can just take the train into town. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Great. Thanks. Yeah.